Hello, everyone, and on today's episode of Locked on Canadians, we are talking Jan Mishak, we're talking Brett Stapley, and our special guest is answering all of your listener questions all inside today's show. Locked on Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 679 of Locked On Canadians. As always, thank you for making us your first listen of the day. If you're listening to this wherever you get your podcast, or if you're watching My Shining Face here on YouTube, uh, thank you for subscribing. Please subscribe. Remember, Friday, 7.30 p.m., I will be doing the Hot Ones Gauntlet and answering all of your questions in our live stream. As you notice, my wonderful co-host is not here. Laura was held up in Montreal Metro traffic, this, that. I'm stepping in to make sure we get you a show out. I am one of your hosts. I am Scott Matla, and I'm joined by actually one of my uh, co-writers at Habs as in the prize, uh, Hattie, at Hattie Case underscore scouting on Twitter. Thank you for making the time for us, man. I know it's been a busy offseason in Montreal, especially since we hung out at the draft. So uh, thank you for making the time for us today, man. No, of course. Thanks for having me. So I'm just going to I'm going to jump right into this. The World Juniors ended last week to little to no fanfare across the board because it was in August and no one really went and we're not talking about that. Mm-hmm. One of the biggest things for this tournament that Habs fans focused on was not Joshua Wah, but he got plenty of attention on his own. It wasn't Oliver Kapanen. It wasn't Pateri Nurmi. It was Jan Mishak as captain of the Czech Republic team or Czechia, uh, pardon me, who seemed to be playing the best out of any Habs prospect at this tournament. And yep. people want to know he's going pro this year. He had a decent OHL season last year. Mm-hmm. What What's your take on Jan Mishak as he uh, joins the professional ranks in North America full time next season, likely going uh, to the Rocket to start next season? Yeah, I'd expect him to spend a year with the Rocket. I think there's a couple things that he'll need to learn in order to really translate his game to the pro level efficiently. Um, you know, small details like cutting to the inside, um, making plays under pressure. Um, there are little things that can be tweaked and adjusted in his game in order to make sure that he's a better uh, offensive player. I think he's tremendous defensively. He's been put in a shutdown role with Hamilton uh, throughout 2021-22 and uh, to a certain extent at the World Juniors. Um, and he performed tremendously in, in those roles. I just think that um, taking our time with Mishak and making sure that um, the, his game is sort of rounded out properly would help him a lot in terms of his long-term development and his offensive potential. Uh, as he stands right now, uh, he's probably got the offensive potential to maybe at, at the best have an impact on the second line. But if you want a bona fide top six defensive forward out of Mishak, I think the best thing is just to let him marinate in the AHL. Um, and the HL puts a lot of pressure on forwards, especially young players, um, to play quickly, to make good decisions with speed. Um, and I think that's what's really properly missing from Mishak's game at the moment. I guess my biggest question is, too, because I know there's some questions about his skating and his overall speed. Do you see him making the NHL as a center, or is he likely going to play some center, play some wing, and then stick in the NHL as I don't want to say a full defensive specialist before I see what he can do with the rocket this year. Obviously that's my realm of knowing Mm -hmm. what's going on here, but do you see his long-term future as a winger more than a center at this point? Well, it depends. Um, You you don't really mind not having that much speed at center. Uh, Center's main role is to connect the defense and the offense. Mainly what you want from your wingers is a bunch of pace, a bunch of speed, a bunch of, um, you know, players who can barrel down the, the boards and, and get around defenders, stuff like that. A center is more sort of analytical, usually more focused on connecting plays and just making smart things happen all over the ice. So I wouldn't worry too much about Mishak in that sense. I know he's pretty quick. Um, there are some issues with the posture, with the agility, uh, but I think that the main, the main thing that makes Mishak so good is – um, his understanding of connectiveness in, in transition, and that's an essential tool to be a center. So I wouldn't mind seeing him at a center. Um, 
if he does move to the wing, I think the might the game might actually get tougher for him because he might lack the the proper high end foot speed to get around defenders and make plays um, down low, circle the net, stuff like that. Um, so it, it's a hard question to answer, but I'd say that he would have the tools to play center, and I wouldn't mind seeing him in that position, especially with the Rocket. If he needs, if the if the Hab system thinks that the best place for him is with Montreal then I'd understand putting him at the wing, giving the center depth that we have. But again, I don't think that he's going to be playing with Montreal at all this season. Um, so I think just letting him play center in the AHL would be the best option for him. I know a lot of people looked at his season and went, ah, well, he was over a point per game, but like he wasn't blowing the doors off of people in what should have been a dominant year. Mm-hmm. And I admittedly, I am not you know, a scouting expert by any means. I just play one on this podcast when people ask us questions. <laughs> Yeah, they went out and got uh, the Hamilton Bulldogs went out and got Mason McTavish and they had other guys that they switched Meshack's role when he was playing with Mason McTavish. His numbers were through the roof and then Mm -hmm. he got switched into a more I don't want to say to make this a shot at Mason McTavish, but a more mature role that, hey, we're trusting you with these minutes to let these guys go produce offense. Mm hmm. Does that kind of speak to the maturity in his game? How, you know, he had a little bit of a pro run when he was, I think, 18 when the OHL was shut down. It didn't go well for him, but he seems to have matured a lot. And how he played for the checks in this tournament, I I think it's opened a lot of people's eyes uh, in what Jan Mishak can be for uh, a team going forward here. Yeah, well, it's important also to keep in mind that um, Mishak's been playing pro since the year before he was drafted. In 2018-19, he was playing for for the Czechian um, pro, the, the, the top division in Czechia, in the pro league. So this is a player who has, has a lot of experience playing against men. The thing is, being able to play pro and being a, a good top-end pro are two completely different things. You can play pro for as long as you want, Um but if you don't do the right things at the right times, if you don't um, time your runs, if you don't uh, receive pucks in your hip pocket, move them quickly, play give and go, there's a lot of little details that go into making a, a high-end NHL. So to me, his track record of playing pro, it matters much less to me than what's actually happening on the ice against pros. So you look at a guy like Artui Lekkonen, who I think has a very, very similar profile and ceiling to, to Jan Mishak. Um, Lekkonen has also been playing pro for a very long time. He's learned the, the ins and outs of defensive play that way, um, on top of being a good scorer from mid-range. And it's, it's very similar to Mishak, where he doesn't necessarily get to the, to the high-end areas as much. Um, and you know, is, is very good defensively, has decent skating, but nothing really pops out offensively. And I don't want to say that the most we're going to get out of Mishak is Arturi Lekkonen. Even then, that would still be good. But there's a couple extra notches of offensive potential that can be unlocked with a couple tweaks in his game. Um, and, you know, for me, it's just a matter of having him play that pro season, that full pro season, and we'll see where it goes from there. I mean, maybe he, he doesn't do so well with Laval, and maybe he, you know, his game isn't as suited for the North American style as we think it is, but we'll only know once he's on the ice. From what I've seen, I think he'll do well, especially defensively. I have some questions offensively and in terms of his skating posture and all that, but um, he's still very young. I mean, he was drafted only two years ago. He's in his draft minus two season, heading, heading into his draft minus three. I mean, he's got a lot of runway ahead of him to keep progressing. So um, I, w- I could see him become a very decent NHL. And he's not the only prospect we're talking about. We do have listener questions. But in the next segment, we're going to take a second. Former Habs prospect signs an AHL deal to sign, play with the Rocket this year. We're going to have Hattie break that down. And that's all coming up next. But first, a word from our sponsors at betonline.net. It's your number one source for all your pro and college football betting needs and other sports all year. You can get all the latest league developments, game matchups, news, podcasts, including this year's opening week games in the NFL and college football. They have all your wagering info, including live betting, esports, scores, everything you could need. And it's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite events, including baseball, MMA, boxing, golf. Hockey is right around the corner, too, folks. They have everything there. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. Bet online where the game starts. We are back. We are joined again by Hattie from Habs Eyes on the Prize, Topper Prospects. And before we dive into some of our listener questions, because we got about a dozen of them uh, when we put a tweet out earlier, 
Uh, we got some unexpected news today that I wasn't anticipating. Uh, Brett Stapley, who was not uh, offered an entry-level contract by the Montreal Canadiens, I believe it was last week that his rights expired. Uh, mm -hmm. He just missed the cut in the top 25 under 25 because I think a lot of us were voting with the thought he's not going to be here in a week. It doesn't really matter. Yep. He signed an AHL deal today with the Laval Rocket, and I, I will get your take on this one one second, but – I love this because the Canadians have made this very weird habit of just hitting on seventh round picks playing yep. for their AHL organization. Jake Evans, mm -hmm. Caden Primo, Raphael Harvey Pinard. We're going to see Xavier Simino this year. And now we're going to see Brett Stapley too. I don't know what it is, but the higher the number that gets, if you sign an AHL deal or an entry level deal and you go to the rocket, you end up turning into a pretty damn good prospect I, yep. I haven't seen Stapley play much in person. I saw him play at the Frozen Four in Buffalo a few years ago where I thought he was one of Denver's better players. But mm -hmm. there was a lot that it didn't look like he was going to sign despite good production. He's older. What's your take on Brett Stapley? And I know it's an AHL deal, so it's we're not clamoring for him to get called up. But this feels like a good bet that if it works out, then you just give him the NHL deal anyways. You get that prove-it window now at the professional level. That's exactly it. It's a it's a prove it contract, and I think that's exactly what um, the Habs should be according to for later round picks at this point. They've done it with Simono, and now we're seeing it with Brett Stapley. Um, Brett Stapley to me doesn't really strike me as anything particularly special. He does have good vision, good hands. Nothing that really pops out at you. I mean, he can he can thread passes through seams and stuff like that. But um, there are a couple lackings in his game that I think are, are pretty evident. Um, first, his inside play is, is almost non-existent. Um, he very rarely cuts to the inside and makes plays through checks. He usually uh, stays around the perimeter and, and threads passes through themes that way. Uh, the other main thing is um, I don't see him play under pressure very quickly either. I mean, this is a player that excels with open ice and a lot of, you know, puck possession time. And the higher up you go in the rankings of the – the less time per puck touch you get. So that's always a concern when it comes to a player. If they excel with as much, you know, puck possession time as possible, as they climb the ranks, they're going to have less and less than that. And how do you excel at that point? It's all about adaptability at that point. And that's something I don't really know about Stapley is how necessarily adaptable he is. I mean, I, he adapted pretty well going from the BCHL, BCHL to the NCAA for one of the premier programs in Denver. But, I mean, the NCAA to the AHL is already a massive step, but then you, you take that one step further with the NHL, and it's, it's a lot of hurdles he needs to, to go through in order to get to that level. But if you get anything out of this player in the seventh round in 2018, it's found money. Like, there's there's nothing to lose in this scenario. So I have no problem against this this, this contract, and I really hope the, the best out of Brett Stapley. If we got a seventh round pick to, to become an NHLer, I mean, that would just be another one in the long list. I mean, Harvey Pinard's probably a lock um, to become that, that next seventh round pick. And I wouldn't be surprised necessarily to see Stapley right behind him, but there's a couple hurdles and he'll need to go through before he's really NHL ready. My one thought is, is that when I watched Stapley, because he and Jake Evans kind of had part of their careers overlap and then Evans went pro, my mm -hmm. thought was hoping that he has good numbers, never anything that like lights the NCAA on fire. He's not going to be one of the leading scorers, even though he was up there this year. He doesn't mm -hmm. get that recognition because he kind of quietly goes about it. He's not like Caulfield was when he was lighting up the NCAA. Yeah. Does that kind of quietness in this play, can he be like a Jake Evans that, hey, well, obviously Evans didn't get that AHL contract first. He got the entry level deal after that, but hey, can you know you prove that and then he becomes that bottom six uh, center winger that they need. Sometimes they want a bit of speed or offense there as opposed to, you know, a Michael Pozzetta, God bless his soul. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that's more or less the best we, that we could expect. That's the best case scenario out of uh, Brett Stapley. Because again, he's 23 already. I mean, the, the runway to improve isn't massive and obviously anyone can improve um, you, you see 30 year olds, you know, get better using the right coaching, the right development teams and all that stuff. But um, the older you get, the least you have time to improve. So for me, um, it's all about caution with, with Stapley. You know, we shouldn't expect him to be anything at the NHL level. Again, it's found money. If he is, it's great. Um, but he's got that subtlety about his game, especially with the puck. I mean, soft hands, 
Um, he's got good inside out moves. There's a couple, there's a couple key, um, there's a couple key foundational tools that he has that could carry him to the NHL on their own, but not without being a liability in another dimension. So it's just about rounding out his game. If he rounds out his game, I, w- I wouldn't be surprised at all to see him in a bottom six role. Um, he's most likely, likely going to be a fourth liner though, based on what I saw, but, um, Again, we're going to see how he does in the AHL, and that'll be a bit more telling on what his, his true ceiling would be. So we do have one more NTA-related uh, question before we go into our break and into our next segment. One of our listeners wants to know, uh, has the progression of Jakob Dobish made him a possible NHLer? And I know he's only played one year at Ohio State, but it was a damn good one for the Buckeyes. <laughs> yeah. Um, the short answer is yes. I think he's got a lot of very – you know, brilliant tools about him as a goaltender. First, he's massive at 6'4", 200 pounds. Um, he's, he tracks pucks exceptionally well. He fills the net really well. He doesn't overcommit necessarily. He can bite hard on deeks, but most of the time he's able to um, stay within his parameters and, and understand what's going on around him and, and react accordingly. Um, he knows when to challenge attackers, when to, you know, go above his crease and when to, to you know, um, sort of retreat into his, his, uh, his blue circle when he needs to. So it's just about um, really having a, a, an even stronger impact. If he keeps progressing like he has from last year to this year, um, I wouldn't be surprised to see him in the NHL. I don't think he's going to be a perennial starter, uh, you know, someone who's going to consistently put up, you know, 910 plus save percentages in the NHL. But I, I think there's a, a decent amount of assets within this goaltender to probably make him a one, a one B or a very, very solid backup, a bit like we're seeing with Jake Allen right now. Um, but yeah, he, he's got a lot of very interesting uh, aspects to him. I've watched him a lot this season with Ohio state and I've always come away impressed. He saved games on his own and, and it's almost too easy for him at this level. And we have so many more listener questions. We're going to talk draft. We're going to talk undirected people, all from our listeners. And that's all coming up next. So we are back with Hattie from Habs as in the prize, Dauber prospects. And we're just going to jump right into our listener questions here. we got a handful of these just for our final segment here. Who is your favorite early 2023 prospect? And why are they Leo Carlson and Callum Ritchie? That's from my buddy Sam on uh, on Twitter. Um, Leo Carlson is fun. He is he's something else. I mean, watching him, he's smooth with it. He he knows how to handle the puck properly. Um, he's got a wicked shot. I think Carlson to me is almost a lock for a top ten at this point. I mean, this is in a really really deep draft at the top end. There are easily you know fifteen guys that could warrant a top ten pick, um, and we'll be fighting for that spot. Um, Callum Ritchie, I haven't watched enough of so far. I've watched him a tiny bit, um, you know, viewing other players the, last year, but um, he's one of the guys I've got my radar on and I want to focus on in the next couple of days after uh, after this uh, Cédric Guindon video I'm working on. So um, that's one of the guys I'll be watching for. The the one guy that I really like, you know, so far in this early uh, in this early 2023 is um, Zach Benson. Uh, Benson's really impressed me. He was probably one of one of the, if not the best, um, players last year on a Winnipeg Ice team that had Matthew Savoy and Connor Geeky. So really impressive of him. He moves a puck extremely well. He's physical. He's he's able to play between checks, to find open ice really well. He's got a wicked shot. He can pass through through sticks like they're not there. Um, that's the main guy that's impressed me a lot so far. Uh, which undrafted player from the last draft really surprised you for not getting picked? And I know you have a few because I was sitting next to you for the entire draft. Oh my God. It, I mean, genuinely, there are so many guys that I can name, but one that I really, really think, and I think for the past, you know, two seasons should have been drafted is Lucas Gustafson from the Chicago Steel. He's a defenseman, um, overage. And to me, it's just, you look at his game and you just, he moves the puck extremely well. He takes care of it really well. He, he reminds me of Matthias Norlander at times. Um, just this very, very strong puck mover with slick hands. Uh, the ability to, you know, move through to, through opponents with ease. Uh, there's Tyler Duke, who honestly, the only reason why he wasn't drafted is he's a 5'9 defenseman. Yuri Tihacek, same thing. Um, 
Graydon Seepman, another defenseman who's a bit undersized, who absolutely should have been drafted just based on his mobility alone. He was probably a top top five or top ten mobile defenseman in this draft. So, I mean, defenseman, there's a long list. Uh, forwards, though. Pano Femis is one that I really liked. Uh, hmm. Adam Barish is another one. So, yeah, there's a long, long list of players that went undrafted this year that really, really should have been selected. And most of them are at the Leafs' development camp. So I'm, I'm really pissed about that. Uh, which QMJHL team do you think is the most interesting going into this upcoming season? Oh, that's going to be tough. Um, I think Halifax is always, you know, in that in that discussion. I think Sherbrooke is really going to be interesting, especially if uh, Joshua Hawak turns, you know, returns to the uh, QMJHL. It'll be interesting to see him without uh, Xavier Parent, who's uh, aged out of the league, and it's going to be interesting to um, to watch Ethan Gauthier with him. Ethan Gauthier is one of the uh, the top draft eligibles from the Q uh, for this year's draft, and he played really well at the uh, at the Helinka Gretzky Cup. He's going to be Hoa's teammate. They might even play on the same line. So seeing that will be really fun. Um, other than that, maybe Moncton. They've got a couple of good guys. Um, it'll be tough though. The the, the Q is always a bit tight in the mid range. So mainly at the top, I'd say it's 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 pretty much uh, Halifax and Sherbrooke that are going to be sort of battling it out. Um, uh, it also depends. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say it also depends if uh, Xavier Borgo and um, uh, and Maverick Bork are back in the queue. I'd be surprised though. They seem like they're going to be graduating, especially given the play that they displayed in, in last season. I mean, man, they're 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 really really good players, and having them both on the roster again for next season would be unfair. So I think I think just based on that, they'll be uh, they'll likely be NHLers. Uh, we have one more kind of relating to the CHL. Which league has the best prospect pool heading into the 23 draft right now? And I've been told it's the WHL. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, there's not even a question. It's the dub. There, there's, I mean, the list is massive. I, I can't even name you all of them off the top of my head. Obviously, Zach Benson. Um, there, there's, I mean, the list is huge, honestly. I, I can't go through all the names, but easily in, in the top 30, there's probably 10, 10 WHLers, if not 15. So, yeah, no, it's a runaway. Uh, another question. What should we expect from Riley Kidney this year, and what do you see as his long-term future fit with the Montreal Canadiens? Uh, this season, he's definitely going to be playing uh, in the queue. I'd be very, very, very surprised if he um, doesn't return to the queue. And, I mean, the, uh, the other option is playing with the Habs, and I don't think that's good for his development. I don't think that's good for the Habs. I don't think that's good for him. Um, so definitely going to be playing in the queue. Uh, he'll try to tear it up again. He had a tremendous season last year. The main issue with Kidney is how how little he gets to the inside. I mean, this is one of the players that I've seen the least, you know, drive the inside lane and, and you know, carry the puck to the net, for example, or stuff like that. He's very, very peripheral. Um, so before anything happens for him NHL-wise, he'll need to unlearn that because I don't know many NHLers that don't, at least drive the inside lane one times out of 10 for him. It's less than that right now in the queue. So something's got to give there. Um, but if he manages to incorporate that into his game, he's got the skill, he's got the hands, he's got the vision. Um, and he's a pretty decent goal scorer. He's got a decent shot. It's pretty underrated. So if he does manage to start driving the inside a lot more often than he does, you're probably looking at a middle six forward. Uh, there, this is a two part question. What is your impression on the Habs behind the scenes draft video? And what have you learned from working on the scouting report videos this off season? Yeah. So the Habs behind the scenes video to me, the first thing that struck me the most is the, the vision and the directive, um, the, the, the direction that the team had. So those two elements really sort of stood out to me in the video. I also saw Christopher Boucher, who had a lot of influence on the scouting process. That is tremendously promising to me because this is one of the pioneers of analytics in hockey. This is a guy with a fantastic brain for the game uh, who knows what he's doing. He knows what he's talking about. He's got experience with models, and he's using those models to to feed the, the selections. He's not making the selections himself, but it's an informative tool for the scouting team in order for them to make more informed decisions and maybe look at specifics that they didn't really focus on at first, at first glance, like zone entries, zone exits, stuff like that. He was very involved in the drafting process. That was interesting. Um, one, one specific thing he said that really struck me was um, when the Habs selected Slavkovsky, he said, 
I'm paraphrasing here, but he said something along the lines of, if that means we don't have to worry about size for the rest of the draft, I'm fine with that. So he said something like, that's a good trade-off, right? So he was completely fine with Slavkovsky, as long as the Habs were able then to not focus on size and just draft players based on talent. And that second part of the question, um, what I've learned the most about scouting, um, you know, through these videos first is that eventing data is tremendously exhaustive and it's, it's a (laughs) skill. You get better at it. I've gone from taking five hours per game to, to track data to down to maybe two and a half, three hours. So I've gotten better at that. That's one thing I've, I've learned to sort of manage my time better when it comes to that. I had to like pause every time something would happen to, to enter the data. Now I could just sort of watch it with the side of my eye and just track what's going on. And it's, it's, it's still accurate and still good. And also I've gotten better at editing, which is really cool. And especially um, I've noticed how flawed almost every analytics model is because of personal differences. I've been discussing with other people in the analytics sphere, sort of what they consider a dump in, a successful dump in, what they consider a shot attempt. And, you know, I worked, I worked for companies that track data as well before, and, and we all have different definitions of, of what those are. There's no sort of, cookie cutter definition for those things so the, just based on that there's already ver- ver- variety and then you know you you take the whole you know time frame into account the whole idea of would you would you rather track um three games or five or seven or nine where do you stop um obviously the bigger the sample the better it is and there's just a lot of d- little details like these that i've i've learned a lot about um, since starting these videos, and I'm going to keep going. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be swapping after these uh, 11 picks. I'll probably go back to Sean Farrell, to Joshua Hua, make some analytic, anal- analytical videos about them. So uh, we'll see about that. Uh, we got time for one more here before we got to uh, put a wrap on this. Uh, this one is, what player picked by the Habs after the first two rounds in the last two drafts is most likely to be a productive NHL regular who has the highest ceiling? I'm going to have to go back to 2021 just to make sure I'm not missing anyone. For the moment, I, I really think Lane Hudson is the guy. Um, but he was but a second-round re- pick, though. That's the thing. Oh, okay. Outside so excluding. the first two rounds, yes. Okay, gotcha. So that'll be a bit more difficult. Um, let me just see here. Like, I feel like I'm the, the easy answer is Evan's going to go, it's going to be Joshua Waugh based on everything the, that he's done. And... But it's still less likely, I would say. Like, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's – I don't say – I wouldn't say he's a guaranteed NHL or still. He's, there's still some things to work out that I think will be worked out. But in terms of certainty hmm. – Like, I'm yeah, looking I, at who they would have picked in, you know, 2021 here. And, like, Dmitry yeah, no, Kostenko, it's, I don't think that's going to be nope. a uh... – <laughs> Mm, not yet, anyway. Um, William Trudeau, yeah, no, I, I'd say Joshua Hawa is the most certain out of all of them. Because um, my heart says Xavier Simono, but I know I'm biased, so I don't want to go that direction. <laughs> um, I really like this prospect. Just a fantastic, just great vision, great to compete. I mean, he's got a bunch of pro-ready tools. Um, but just from what I've seen from Joshua Hawa this season, I mean... If you're talking about the the most certain player, I'd say it's him, but Simono's a close second. I was going to say, because in 2022, I look at, like, hold on, let me see. Because I, I got to bring up this, even though I, I really like Vincent's roar, and every scout we've talked to has just raved about how smart this kid is. And, like, mm. I think that makes him likely to be an NHL piece, maybe not a high-end offensive one, but someone – I just look at that and I go – too many people have told me too many good things about this kid and the way he reads the game for me to not look at this and go, I am all about this. Like, and goalies are yeah. hard too. Like I look at Emma Cruteau and I'm like, I don't know. Mm. Anything. Admittedly, I know nothing about you. Goalies are hard. I've, well. I've literally, I've watched one game of his since um, so it was, and it was after the draft year. No, actually I watched one before and one after. That's all I've got on Koto. That's why I've downloaded three games of his and I'll be going into in depth into his game and all that. But come back to Roar, I I understand why scouts are saying he's smart. I just don't think he's the he's so smart that it requires raving of. I think Roar's main tool is how intense and and determined he is. Uh, maybe off ice interviews have given them an, an insight that I don't have. Just based on what what I've seen on the ice from him, it doesn't strike me as tremendously. Um, deceptive or, or manipulative offensively, which is the main tools I look for for intelligence. Um, 
I'm watching Cedric Guindon right now. I'm, I'm going through his footage and breaking down his uh, his data right now. And so far for me, Guindon is extremely smart, extremely aware. Um, this is a sneaky, sneaky good pick from the Habs. I'd say he's in the he's in the conversation in terms of picks outside the two rounds that have NHL potential or, or near certain NHL potential. I mean, he's got the brain for it for sure, and the and the pace. And his his brain keeps up with his feet as well. So not only is he quick, but he thinks quick and moves quick and 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 reacts quickly. So, I mean, that's what you look for from an NHLer. So I, I'd say he's in that conversation as well. So we do have to put a wrap on this. Unfortunately, we have hit our thirty minute mark. Uh, Hattie, do you want to tell them our listeners where they can find your work and find you on social media and whatnot? So you can find me on YouTube at uh, Hattie Kalakesh and uh, NHL Draft Scouting. It's my full name that shows up on the on the um, on the screen there. Followed by N- NHL Draft Scouting. Uh, pretty easy to find there. And on Twitter, um, you can find me at Hattie K underscore Scouting. So those are the main two platforms I I post uh, information on. I post scouting reports and stuff like that on. And I, I always come out with uh, top thirties, top fifties, and you know top four round um, rankings when you know draft time comes around. So you can look forward to that. Uh, also, once the seasons kick up, you can find Hattie doing Catching the Torch at Eyes in the Prize and his usual stuff exactly. over at Dauber Prospects. Um, mm-hmm. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Canadians, wherever you get your podcast every single day. Remember, YouTube, Friday night, I'm going to be doing the Hot Ones Gauntlet. I'm going to suffer, and it's going to be awful, and I'm not going to love it, but we would love for you to be there. 7.30 p.m., jump in the live stream, hang out in the chat, ask questions, watch me suffer, etc. You can follow myself at Scott Mallow. You can follow my co-host at The Active Stick. And thanks again for making Lockdown Canadians your first listen every day. And now for your second listen, go check out the Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022. It's an eight-episode extravaganza to get you ready for the NFL season. The local team experts of the Lockdown Podcast Network, plus a betting angle from Lee Sterling of Lockdown Bets, all combining into one Ultimate NFL Preview. Search Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022 on your Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts.